All right, so I wanna to talk to you about the different ways which an Intel processor can execute. And to do that, Intel has provided us with this extremely helpful and not at all messy finite state machine. So all roads of resets lead to real mode. So let's go ahead and start there. So in the beginning, there was real mode and it was the suck from a security perspective. It is the original execution mode of the Intel 8086 processor. And that means that basically old software, things like DOS run in real mode. But of course, because it's the very first mode of execution, it does, it's not very featureful, right? It doesn't have virtual memory, which we'll learn all about in this class, it has no privilege levels. So there's no security separation. Everything's all just running in one big executable space. And that's why, you know, older operating systems were very, uh, unreliable because different processes could scribble all over everybody's memory and crash the overall system. And it is the original sort of 16-bit execution mode. Now, like that finite state machine showed, if you reset your processor, it is going to go back into real mode. And so everything always starts in real mode every time you power on and power off the processor. And so that's why it's usually the job of things like the BIOS to get you out of real mode as soon as humanly possible and get you into the more uh, functional, featureful, protected mode. So that's why we're not really going to cover real mode that much in this class. We're going to cover it in Architecture 4001, which is more of the BIOS class. All right, so if we started in real mode and we got a system management interrupt, we would find ourselves in system management mode. So system management mode is an interesting execution mode. It's basically a isolated mode off to the side. It's invoked by that system management interrupt, like mentioned, but it has the capability for self-protection. So essentially the code that executes in this special system management RAM and this special system management mode, it can protect itself against even the most powerful and privileged operating systems or hypervisors. And so the original point of it was to have something that couldn't uh, be messed up that would be responsible for things like power management, something that uh, needs to be done transparently in the background, doesn't necessarily need any operating system specific things because it's more of a hardware specific type thing. Uh, and also, you know, Intel had recommended it for use via for security functionality. And so for a long time, uh, you know, BIOS vendors and things like that would put uh, security critical code into system management mode. So if you're familiar with other uh, processors, things like ARM systems that have Trust Zone, Trust Zone to me feels analogous to SMM because it's basically where you may have all of the security critical code in you know, some special isolated area of memory, but it's really just a different processor execution mode which isolates it. It's not actual true hardware separation. They're all, all code just running on the same processor and you're hoping that your security mechanisms keep it isolated. Uh, and so SMM is kind of interesting from that perspective. But again, uh, this is a thing that is more relevant to stuff like BIOSes. So we're going to be covering that in Architecture 4001 instead of this class. So from real mode, if you set some particular bit, you would find yourself in protected mode. Now, protected mode is the main thing that uh, most operating systems actually execute in. And there's this quote from the manual that I put in here just to you know, call out the fact that it's saying uh, there's a special way of executing in protected mode where you kind of pretend like you're in 8086 mode, you pretend like you're in real mode, and that's called virtual 8086 mode. This is sort of a backwards compatibility mechanism. And the only reason I pull it out is just because it says virtual 8086 mode is actually a protected mode attribute that can be enabled for any task uh, it is not actually a processor mode. So even though Intel has it on its finite state machine, they say right in their manual that it's not actually a real processor mode. So we're mostly not going to, well, we're entirely not going to care about virtual 8086 mode. You can just think of it like when Windows first started having, you know, 32-bit execution and they wanted to run you know, 16-bit DOS programs because backwards compatibility is the most important thing. Uh, virtual 8086 mode is a way that they achieved that. Now, protected mode overall is important because it's the place that starts adding the nice functionality like virtual memory and privilege rings, the capability to actually isolate the kernel from user space. So like I said, all modern operating systems are going to be executing in protected mode. 
So from protected mode, you could set some bits and you would find yourself in IA32E mode or long mode. So this is the actual 64-bit mode. This is the thing we said has many names, but AMD, when they originally created the x86-64 extensions, called it long mode. So that's why on the finite state machine, you'll see LME, long mode enable, for the AMD long mode. So Intel calls it things in their manual like IA32E or Intel 64, but like we said in the architecture 1001 class, uh, we're just going to call it x86-64. So from this picture, uh, we said that, you know, real mode and system management mode are mostly left for architecture 4001. We said that virtual 8086 mode is not even real mode according to Intel's own manuals. So if we go ahead and, you know, simplify this down, what we end up with is this. So you always start in real mode and you try to get to protected mode as soon as humanly possible. And then from there, a 64-bit capable operating system is going to move its way into 64-bit mode. And here's our missing little reset because you will always land back in real mode whenever you reset. Now, if you like finite state machines, here's another finite state machine for you. It is the AMD version of the exact same state machine. And quite frankly, I like it better. I feel like it's cleaner. I feel like it's cooler because, you know, it looks like an alien. It specifically looks like the aliens from batteries not included. But my references are old and I should feel old. So updated just for this class, 2018's Black Manta. So from now on, when you see the AMD finite state machine covering processor execution modes, you will see nothing but Black Manta. So giving this the sort of simplification that we gave the other finite state machine, after reset, you always land yourself in real mode, setting some sort of bit, which here is a little more specific. That's why I like this picture. It says CR0 PE, not just PE1. That gets you into protected mode. Set some more bits and you're gonna get yourself into compatibility mode. And from there, set some more bits and get yourself into 64-bit mode. So the thing I like about this graph, besides the fact that it's much more specific about uh, the particular bits that need to be set in order to transition your way through the finite state machine, is that it makes it a little more clear that long mode kind of does have uh, two ways of operating. There's the true 64-bit mode, which is what you're gonna get when you're executing a 64-bit application in the 64-bit kernel. And then there's compatibility mode, which is sort of the backwards compatible way of uh, getting 32-bit execution uh, out of the system. So you might have a 64-bit kernel, but it could execute your 32-bit program in compatibility mode. And compatibility mode basically looks exactly like protected mode in 32-bit executing processors. So that's it for our processor execution modes. Now we're going to spend a whole bunch of time figuring out, you know, what exactly are all these bits and what do they mean and how do we get to 64-bit mode for an operating system that wants to do that.